Asik Bertasuke, a uh, associate uh, from way, way back, and to the other members of the breakfast uh, forum. Thank you. This topic is a very complicated topic, and uh, this can be an all-day topic, an all-week uh, topic, but uh, the organizer gave me only 15 minutes <laughs> and 10 minutes for open forum, but I'll try my best. Uh, I'm very familiar with some of the personalities here. And uh, I gave this the title of a quick look at the China threat. And uh, you can uh, access my blog. I have plenty of uh, articles, my email to various uh, e-groups, also my Facebook. And uh, there's a very act there are so many active threads uh, on my Facebook linked uh, with other Facebook accounts like uh, Bugu Bugu, for example, uh, the Facebook account of uh, PMA uh, graduates and uh, those who pass through PMA. So I'll try my best uh, to do this in 15 minutes. Of course, yung uh, bumulga sa atin, yung China's Air Defense Identification Zone, and the impact on regional security, I got this from the Center for Strategic International Studies based in Washington, D.C. It says here that close coordination and defense cooperation with Japan the ROK and other regional partners and a clear strategy for sustaining U.S. forward presence are all essential elements in dissuading Beijing from further pursuing an escalatory strategy that would undermine regional security. Leaders in the U.S. and Japan are likely to view these escalatory measures as a test of Japan's resolve and of the vitality of the U.S.-Japan alliance. China's aggression, however, is likely to bolster domestic and regional support for Prime Minister Abe's national security agenda and reinforce efforts to strengthen the US-Japan alliance and increase bilateral jointness and interoperability. Support for Japanese views may grow in Southeast Asia as states bordering the South China Sea worry about a similar Chinese move to place the South China Sea ADIC over their disputed islands. And uh, they have a quick discussion here. What are the implications of China's actions for the United States and other regional players? And the answer is, from the U.S. perspective, the ADIC announcement is likely to be seen as a part of a deliberate strategy to bolster Beijing's sovereignty claims, adding to Chinese air and maritime probing in the East China Sea and now the surrounding airspace. The U.S. will seek to encourage the peaceful rise of China while demonstrating consistency in U.S. declaratory policy on the islands. And of course, uh, the diplomat, which is a, a very popular uh, uh, online uh, magazine, has a comment on uh, China's three challenges in 2014. And uh, I think the comment here is uh, very dramatic. C, President C, it is advisors should not succumb to the illusory belief that such a conflict would boost their standing with the Chinese public. Japan, with U.S. backing, would inflict a humiliating military defeat on China. With its political future, depending on its ability to deliver on its reform promises, the last thing C needs is a foreign policy destruction, let alone a disastrous military misadventure. And of course, uh, they're talking of three challenges here on the part of uh, new President Xi Jinping, uh, such as uh, uh, their uh, anti-corruption uh, campaign. And of course, uh, the third challenge is uh, avoiding an unnecessary conflict with Japan. Japan's stable ambitions in the Indian Ocean, which is very relevant. Both Japan and China are heavily dependent on trade traversing the Indian Ocean and the Strait of Malacca. Increasing its naval presence in the Indian Ocean would improve Japan's ability to secure its supply lines in these critical waterways. But Japanese supply lines remain vulnerable to Chinese action in the South China Sea. An enhanced Japanese presence in the Indian Ocean redresses the weakness by placing for the first time Chinese sea lanes of supply under threat from independent Japanese maritime action. India advances in naval arms race with China. This is uh, this follows uh, what I've always been saying, but every action 
that is a counteraction. India regards China's efforts to enhance its naval presence in the Indian Ocean as undermining New Delhi's strategic position. As a response, India has built up its naval capabilities, increasing the likelihood of India joining the naval coalition of Australia, Japan, and the US, the so-called Diamond Alliance. Thus, the scheduled arrival of India's second aircraft carrier from Russia in late January 2014, and that is this month, the INS Pikra Madhya has been celebrated as a symbol of India's growing naval power, as the new ship will make India's Navy Asia's only fleet with two aircraft carriers. The 45,000-ton aircraft carrier is significantly larger than any Indian naval carrier, naval vessel, and boasts some of the most advanced combat capabilities with its 10 Camo 31 helicopters and 24 MiG-29K fighters. This addition will enable the Indian Navy to achieve a strategic goal of operating full carrier battles concurrently in its western, that's in the Pakistan area, and eastern theaters of operation, that's in the Indian Ocean part closer to the South China Sea. That's uh, part of India's Navy. China asserts control over vast area angering neighbors and uh, the U.S. We're talking here of the, the new uh, fishing policy. Vietnam, Taiwan, and the Philippines, and the U.S. have criticized China for imposing new access rules. I think we're all familiar with this and don't want to give any detail, more details. For the vast South China Sea saying, Beijing's demand that foreign vessels get approval to enter the disputed maritime areas is provocative and potentially destabilizing. And of course, uh, we're very happy that the DFA has issued this statement, Philippines will not obey China's South China Sea rules. Another headline uh, from the palace, Philippines won't accept China Sea law. Uh, the Philippines will not recognize China's new fisheries regulation, which encroaches in the country's exclusive economic zone and on international waters, Malacanian said yesterday. And that was uh, dated January 12. But, uh, there's a news, a very, I call this a loose uh, news uh, that went viral uh, towards the middle of uh, the month. China moving to retake Ireland from the Philippines report. This came from One China Times, uh, which is a, uh, a magazine, uh, an online magazine based in Taiwan. And uh, this talked of the PLA plans to retake the disputed island of T2, at uh, this Pakasa in the South China Sea this year. Reports, uh, but actually they picked up a report from uh, the Philippines, quoting a report on Chinese business and political website, Kianzhan. Claimed by China and Taiwan, but controlled by the Philippines, Tito or Pagasa. I was there in 1971, I was part of the, the group that uh, sent troops and arms and supplies uh, to that island. The second largest island in the hotly disputed Spratly chain. The island was formerly known as TZ in Chinese, but has more recently been known as Zhongyi. And uh, this is another news item, Chinese troops to seize Zhongyi Island back from the Philippines in 2014. And they're talking of a Chinese move that is going to, that could happen this year. But of course, I'd like to reiterate, this is a uh, loose article. This did not come from official sources in China, but has gone viral. And a lot of people are very concerned about this. What if China, this is from the diplomat, a, a very uh, popular uh, uh, diplomatic <coughs> online magazine, and they pose the question, what if China did invade Pakasa Island? The political court, uh, and their answer is this, the political fallout from seizing Pakasa would be a huge setback to Chinese diplomacy. ASEAN would likely adopt an uncompromising political position and demand the immediate withdrawal of Chinese forces. ASEAN would receive political backing from the international community. Chinese aggression would even be raised at the United Nations, but China would veto any discussion by the Security Council. Chinese, China's action in Sisi Pakasa would set up a race by claimant states to beef up the defense of their islands. This would likely include increased combat air patrols, anti-shipping exercises, and the deployment of conventional submarines. Several of the larger islands could be expected to house anti-ship missiles. 
And of course, uh, the, the repercussions are not going to be only diplomatic. This could trigger the invocation of the RPUS Mutual Defense Treaty. Uh, a lot of people are saying that uh, this may not fall under the MDT because uh, the island is a disputed island. But uh, let us uh, stress that there is no way that there can be an armed attack on the Pakasa Island on, or any of the Philippine territories inside this practice without attacking our armed forces. And Article 5 of the U.S. Mutual Defense Treaty is very clear. For purposes of Article 4, an armed attack on either of the parties is deemed to include an armed attack on the metropolitan territory of either of the parties or on the island territories under its jurisdiction in the Pacific, Pacific Ocean, its armed forces, public vessels or aircraft in the Pacific. I'd like to reiterate, there is no way that anyone can conduct an armed attack on any of our island is practice without attacking our armed forces or any of the public vessels or public aircraft that may happen to be in that territory. And of course, uh, U.S. Congress has reacted very strongly. The U.S. Congressman with one tough stance uh, versus uh, China. And uh, this came from uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Republican, uh, this is the U.S. House Joint Committee hearing for its alleged propensity. Uh, China came under fire to use coercion, bullying, and salami slicing tactics to secure its maritime interests in the East and South China Seas. Republican Representative Steve Chabot called China dangerously aggressive and said it was attempting to take disputed territories by gradual force with the misguided hope that Japan, Southeast Asian nations, and the U.S. will just gradually accept it. So they, and uh, this, uh, this was uh, preceded by several other pronouncements coming from the U.S. Senate who are very concerned about China's bullying in this part of the world. Now, let's look at the geo. Uh, those are the, the current events, but uh, there are uh, situations that will remain uh, constant uh, over so many years, and that is the geopolitical reality of uh, China with respect to the neighbor countries. This is uh, the map of uh, China and the surrounding uh, uh, countries. So we have uh, the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the uh, Malacca Strait and the Indian Ocean, Japan, Philippines, uh, Australia, Indonesia, uh, and India. The preceding map that I showed shows that the South China Sea links the Indian Ocean to the vast Pacific Ocean. It is a choke point. The power that controls the South China Sea can control the economy of major economic powers like China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines, which is now considered an emerging economic power. India must pass through the South China Sea to interact with China, Vietnam, the Philippines, Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. This may come as a shock to many, but students of sea power, strategist Alfred Tayaman, know this. China suffers from a very vulnerable geography. For years, in talk shows and speeches, in Congress, in uh, public fora, I have been saying this. China is surrounded in all directions and has a short coastline compared to its landmass and population. China's naval assets have very restricted maneuvering space, unlike those of India, Japan, Indonesia, even the Philippines, and of course, the United States. China's sea lines of communications, or SLOCs, are very vulnerable. Sea lines of communication, or SLOC, is a term describing the primary maritime routes between ports used for trade, logistics, and naval forces 